Okay, so off we go. Uh, we uh, were talking about how to parameterize stuff last time. So um, again, uh, the, the, the point of view, of, the big overarching point of view I want you to have on parameterizing stuff is that there is not one single you know, method for how to do it. It's tools in your toolbox, right? So here's another tool that's uh, useful sometimes, uh, specifically if you're interested in a line. You want to parameterize a line. So the neat observation to make is that uh, if you start with a point on the line, right, and if from that point on the line, if you think, well, I'm just going to go varying lengths, varying amounts in the direction given by some what we call direction vector, V, right, well, um, the further I want to go in that v direction, I can accomplish that just by multiplying v by some scalar t. Bigger scalar t, bigger multiple of v, I've moved further in that direction. Right? And uh, so you can kind of imagine that you can think about you know, where does that put me at various different times. And uh, at uh, t equals 0, I'm there. And at uh, t equals 1, I'm going to be about, oh, I guess about there or so. And then at t equals 2, I'm <coughs> about there or so. You can just literally see. I don't know why I'm in this small mode. Uh, you can literally see how those points are tracing out the line over time as t increases. Okay. So I think that's a nice little point of view, and uh, it gives us this very handy and convenient little formula for, uh, you know, again, when you're parameterizing a line, boom, this will do it. Right? All you need, again, is you need a point on the line to play the role that x naught is playing here, and then you need a vector parallel to the line. Uh, let's see, how can I do this? Uh, like that. Um, to uh, play the role that V is playing there. Is that cool? Everybody's good? Okay. Um, here's another tool for your toolbox. Uh, you'd be surprised how often this comes up. Um, <clears throat> sometimes you have an existing parameterization. So in particular, I know that this makes the unit circle, namely like so. That's old news. We talked about that previously. Um, uh, but I want a different curve to be parameterized. I want this ellipse with this equation right here. So I have one curve parameterized. I want a related curve parameterized. And I say related because, uh, I mean, that's where ellipses come from, right? You, one way to think about how you create ellipses is you take the unit circle and you stretch it by different amounts in different directions depending on the various coordinates. So in particular, this 3 here is our Q that we are stretching in the x direction by a factor of 3. And I can algebraically accomplish that without much trouble. Notice that uh, here, again, is my existing parameterization that I'm starting with. And stretching in the x direction by a factor of 3 is pretty easily accomplished by just literally multiplying those x coordinates themselves by 3. Right? And then along those same lines, uh, what's the deal with this 2 here? Well, that 2 is our indication that we're stretching the unit circle vertically by a factor of 2 uh, as part of what we do to make this ellipse. And so, again, stretching in the uh, y direction by a factor of 2, well, we're literally going to be making the y coordinates 2 times as big. So now notice the nice punchline then is I started with a parameterization of one curve. I have now ended with a parameterization of this different curve. And I didn't have to sort of start over from scratch uh, and uh, you know think about various different clever creative ways. that you know, I, Technically, you could make this work by other methods, but I think it's really much more convenient to think about it this way. So again, sometimes useful. Okay. All right. Now, uh, a broad statement about parameterizations. Uh, I think uh, it is easy. Whoops. Uh, wrong button. It is easy to conflate parameterizations with equations. And this is a problem. 
It, I mean, let's look back at the example we were just looking at here. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Let me clean up the mess. Get rid of all of this. And for, hmm, <laughs> for this ellipse, on the one hand, here's the equation. On the other hand, here's the parameterization. And notice these are very, very much not the same algebra. They're pretty doggone different looking. Right? So um, I think this is a real problem. A lot of students make the mistake of thinking, oh, yeah, well, if there's a geometric thing, then uh, algebra is just, you know, you write that down, and that just tells you what you're talking about. But very importantly, no, you have to know what kind of uh, relationship between the algebra you're writing down and the geometry producing are you talking about, right? And that relationship's very different for, you know, writing down an equation versus creating a parameterization. So uh, this is my little uh, diagram to uh, indicate, you know, most, what I think is most fundamentally what the big difference is. Parameterizations generate points, you can see it right there in the formula for what a parameterization does, right? Uh, we talked about position being a function of time. I'm going to just sort of phrase that a little bit differently as uh, you give me some parameter to put in to a parameterization, and that parameterization generates as its outputs points on the curve. So thus the term point generator. And very importantly, this is not what equations do, right? An equation of a curve is a totally different relationship. An equation does not generate points, right? This thing right here, that doesn't create points. It doesn't produce numbers X and Y at all. What this does is test points. If you give me a point x comma y, I can plug in those values of x and y, and I can work out the left side, and I can see if the equation works. And then either it does, in which case I've got a point on my curve, or it doesn't, in which case, no, that's, that point's not on the curve. Right? So again, different uh, relationship. You give me a point, you plug into the equation, and out comes either uh, a yes or a no. Right? Okay. All right, so please make sure to be very clear in your mind that these are not the same thing, right? A, uh, a parameterization is not just kind of, that's basically an equation. No, it's really very importantly not. Um, the, uh, with this in mind, I, this is one of my little pet peeve little things is a lot of people refer to a parameterization as parametric equations and then they put the word right in there that we're trying to distinguish it from right to me that's just I don't see the motivation for that at all it seems counterproductive to me uh, so it's a heads up you are going to see the phrase parametric equations um, I always bristle a little bit uh, for this reason okay so here's a nice example where we can uh, capitalize on understanding the distinction between these two constructions um, reasonable question here. Uh, suppose I look at this thing here. Now you'll recognize immediately that's a parametric curve. Right. Position is a function of time. Three space, three coordinates. Um, and okay, well that curve in space, um, does it or does it not? And if so, where does it intersect with this plane for which I'm giving you an equation? So uh, two different kinds of algebra, right? Importantly, different kinds of algebra. So, all right, well, how are we going to uh, deal with this question then? And roughly speaking, uh, <laughs> the uh, process is step one, generate points with your parameterization, and then test them with your equation. And notice that's exactly what uh, I've uh, represented with this algebra here. Um, the way you generate points with our parameterization, here's our parameterization, and that's what this is right there. Uh, let me get rid of the blue for the moment. Uh, I'm literally producing points with coordinates x, y, z by those equations given by that parameterization because that's what parameterizations do. And those points that are parameterized now having 
having created some points, what can I do with this equation? Well, I can test and see which ones of those points are also on this plane. And the way you test is by plugging in to the equation. And uh, just to emphasize, uh, when I say plugging into the equation, uh, keep in mind that this is my x. In fact, here, let me do it better. Like I'll do it like that is my x. So that goes where x goes in the equation. And likewise, this is ex specifically an explicit. That's my formula for y. So that goes where y is in the equation. And likewise, this is my z. And that then goes where z goes in the equation. Everybody on board? Yeah. So <clears throat> with uh, that perspective in mind, uh, this question of, um, you know, do these intersect uh, turns into, I just need to solve out this, this algebra right here. That's single variable algebra. Nothing to it. And uh, there you go. There's a couple of different values of t. Now, to be fair, that's not what the question asked. What the question asked was, what are the points? You know, we want what points x, y, z, what I have found are values of t. How am I going to get the points from the value of t? Well, no problem. The thing that turns t into points is the parameterization. So you're going to take these two values of t, you're going to plug into that parameterization, and out come the points in question. Everybody happy? All right. So again, important distinction between, you know, structurally, what purpose are these two uh, algebraic constructions uh, serving? And you, you have to understand that distinction of, of uh, how they work to be able to make this question make sense. Yeah? So can the final answer just be represented by t equals plus minus? No, because the question asks for points, and these are not points. Yeah, so I mean, this if, if you were to write down just this, uh, you'd be, uh, as I, I like to um, uh, make a silly sports metaphor, you're spiking the football on the two-yard line. Yeah, so yeah. Now, I know that I did that here, but I did it because I knew I was going to be in a classroom context, and I knew I'd be able to talk through that last little step. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yes. So then to get the points, would you just plug in that, the, yep. what you got for T into X, Y, and Z? Yep, you plug into that, a.k.a. you plug into this right here. Yep, okay. yep, totally. All righty, moving along. Um, <clears throat> I'm calling this a reminder because I think in some sections of Math 218 they do talk about this, but I'm aware that in other sections they don't. Uh, so I don't know if you all have seen this before, but it might be a reminder. Um, uh, if you want to talk about in three dimensions how to test points, it's a little different. Um, because uh, if you have a curve in three dimensions, you can't really write down a single equation. A single equation in three dimensions makes a surface. But if we have a curve, we're going to need, in some sense, more than just a single equation. So um, here's the uh, way I like to motivate uh, the way to do this. Um, here's our parameterization. Keeping in mind what a parameterization does is you give me a value of t, and then this formula produces points. So one sort of like not very useful, but foot in the door way that we can talk about how to test a point is I could say, well, does there exist a value of t that produces the point x, y, z that we want? Oh, yeah. What is that notation in the green? Oh, I, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I always forget to mention that. Um, uh, yeah, so this notation here, that uh, is um, a shorthand for uh, there is or there exists. Uh, and this little weird little shape is another little mathematician shorthand for such that or so that. Uh, there are certain little phrases that mathematicians find themselves using over and over and over and over again, and it's just nice to streamline. Y'all have probably seen uh, this one, uh, the three dots. That means therefore, that kind of thing. 
yeah. And like if with two Fs. Yeah, 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 stuff like that. Yep, totally. Totally. Okay, so um, uh, now this statement that, uh, well, the, the point that we're interested in is on the curve. If there's a value of T that I can plug in that makes this produce that, okay, yeah, but how do I know if there's such a value of T, right? I don't, where, where's the formula for the T? That would, that, how would I know what this T is in order to know that it exists? Um, so the observation to make is uh, that uh, what I really need is to make this equation work. And that one vector equation is true if and only if its three coordinate equations work. And those three coordinate equations you can solve for T. And you get these three scalar equations. So um, another way to phrase our sort of like, you know, foot in the door story is I need to know, is there some value of T that makes these three green equations work? And it turns out, if you think about it, that's actually a much easier question. <laughs> is there a value of T that's equal to all three of these things? Well, that's only possible. There can only be a value of t that equals to all three of these things if, in fact, all three of these things are equal to each other. Right? I mean, this I, is there a value of t that equals to 7 and 6 and 24? <laughs> no, of course not. Those numbers are different. T can't be all different numbers, right? But is there a value of T that's equal to 3 and 3 and 3? Yes, there is. That's, T could be 3. That's the number that's equal to 3, 3, and 3. Right? It's, it's silly to say it, right? But that's really the point that we're making here. So, uh, so this streamlines things very nicely. And if you want to know, is there a value of T, this can be answered very simply by, I need these three things to all equal to each other. And this is what we call the symmetric equations uh, for a line in three dimensions. So uh, neat fact, useful sometimes. Um, and uh, by the way, a lot of students make the mistake of thinking that uh, the way to understand this relationship is by way of, okay, well, let's see here. So uh, this thing here goes there, and again, symbolic manipulations, and not a good plan because sometimes the algebra works out a little bit differently, right? So, for example, what if this A is 0? Then you can't solve for that T, and you've got to sort of tweak this process a little bit. Right, um, not a big problem, uh, but and it's something that you can think through of how to deal with it. But the point I'm trying to get at is, if you think symbolic manipulation, then you're going to occasionally end up with a zero in your denominator, and that's not good, right? So uh, what we're gonna, what I'm going to suggest instead is that you think in terms of solving for t and then writing down the corresponding results uh, and uh, as needed. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's uh, go on to 1.3, talk about dot products. I know you've seen dot products, right? Really big deal in linear algebra. Uh, this formula, old news. And make sure to review all the properties in the book. Right? We're going to be using dot products quite a bit. You want to make sure that you're solid, uh, fully polished on all that stuff. Um, and it just is a cultural point. I like to do this as, uh, as it comes up. But uh, very important to remember that dot products um, are a uh, first example. I, I like to call them a model for this much more powerful and sophisticated idea called an inner product. And I hope and imagine that uh, Math 218 and uh, certainly 221 uh, talked about inner products. So dot product is the model for that. Uh, so um, more powerful even than the formulas that we're going to be using in this course uh, that'll be pretty much exclusively just the Euclidean, just the regular old dot product. Okay, now I have another little pet peeve that I need to um, uh, talk through a little bit, and that is these words perpendicular and orthogonal. Um, our book and many other people... Uh, use these two terms basically interchangeably. And I think that's unfortunate 
because there are two ideas that are almost exactly the same but critically different in subtle ways. And to me, when you have two slightly different ideas and you have two terms, well, we should use one for the one idea and the other term for the other idea to avoid confusion, right? I think it's, I mean, why wouldn't we do that? So very importantly, one idea, and, and you all know what we're talking about, perpendicular, you know, right angles and all that. Um, perpendicular is a geometric idea. It's based on directions that vectors point. You only get a direction if your vectors are non-zero. The zero vector doesn't point unambiguously <laughs> in any direction. You could make the case that it points in all directions, I suppose. But anyway, the, it's uh, you can't talk about something being perpendicular to the zero vector. There is no angle because zero doesn't have a direction. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So to me, perpendicular, again, intrinsically a geometric idea, and you should only use it if you're talking about that specific geometric idea. On the other hand, there is this algebraic idea that the dot product could be zero. And yeah, there's uh, very often, this means the vectors are perpendicular, but not always. Because the dot product can be zero even with u or v being the zero vector, which again, not perpendicular. Right, so I like to use the word orthogonal exclusively for this algebraic idea and the word perpendicular exclusively for this geometric idea. And that avoids the confusion. Now, I didn't get brought up right um, in uh, this sense. And so it is going to happen sometimes just because of just, uh, you know, I just uh, didn't really, I've got years and years and decades of bad habit that I'm still trying to overcome, right? So you are going to hear me sometimes uh, saying perpendicular when what I meant was orthogonal. And you have my apologies in advance for when I do that. So uh, y'all may too have some, you know, bad habits to, to try to, you know, uh, uh, get rid of and uh, something to keep in mind. And it sadly takes effort and oh well. Okay, real quick theorem. Uh, sometimes when you have a non-zero vector, uh, you want to find the unique unit vector that points in that direction. Very handy. In fact, if you think of a vector as being a direction and a magnitude, making the magnitude 1 is kind of a way of ignoring the magnitude as much as possible. And so, therefore, this unit vector pointing in the right direction is very often thought of as the direction. And if you want to talk about a, a direction, how would you just mathematically describe a direction? Well, a unit vector is a pretty natural way to do that. Um, so I'll make the observation, uh, for example, that if I have, uh, if I have a vector v, and if it's uh, k times u, where u is a unit vector, well, that's the magnitude, assuming k is positive. And so it makes sense to think of this as being the direction. So same idea, different sort of phrasing. Anyway, so we need to be able to find uh, what, this, uh, what this unit vector is, and uh, that unique unit vector is computed by this handy-dandy little formula. Make sure that you're good with this formula. Uh, easy to prove, by the way, that for when v is a non-zero vector, this will always be a unit vector. It's a nice little exercise. Give it a try, right? Try to prove that this is always a unit vector. Uh, not, uh, not a, and again, as always, uh, come uh, ask me if you have questions. Okay, component. Again, y'all may have seen this. You may not. I don't know. Um, a component basically says that if you're talking about a direction indicated by some vector, and by the way, it doesn't have to be a unit vector. Sometimes it might not be a unit vector. It's a little sloppy to describe a direction by a non-unit vector, but it, you know, people do it sometimes, and it's fine. 
So if you're interested in a certain direction, then if you're further interested in, okay, yeah, I want to know to what extent does this vector w, to what extent does that point in this v direction? In other words, what is this right here? Right? I, I like my favorite metaphor for this involves football. I don't know if you, know, you don't have to know football for this. But uh, if you uh, start a play with the ball there, and if the ball ends there, right? So the that's the start, and here's where the guy gets tackled or whatever. Um, how many yards did you gain? Well, you, it's not this. That's not how you measure get yardage gain, right? You only get to count yardage gain in the direction of, you know, down, whatever, downfield, you know, whatever. And so the component is literally telling you how much yardage gain when the ball might have moved somewhat sideways. Okay. All righty. So a uh, pretty natural idea. Um, I will point out it could be negative. It's not as I have it drawn here, but if W were back that way, uh, then the component would be like that, which is negative. Does that make sense? All right, so uh, let's see here. Now I've got a huge mess. Let me clean up my mess. Okay, all right. So um, how do we compute components? Um, this is just a little trig exercise. Uh, y'all are experts at trig. I'm going to let y'all read through these details. But uh, So again, notice we have here a right triangle. And when you have a right triangle, you can write down trig and you can solve. And here's your, com your formula for how to compute the component uh, that we were just talking about. So make sure you can fill in those blanks of the, the trig. Um, <clears throat> uh, make sure as well that you memorize this formula. I'm probably going to stop saying that at some point, by the way. I, I do expect that you'll know all the formulas right, from the, from the, uh, the class. Um, real quick observation about that. Uh, you know, I, yeah, it's a lot of formulas. There's 200 and some odd pages of lecture notes that I use here. And it's, uh, it's a lot to know. Um, but in terms of memorizing formulas, I'll point out that a great way to memorize formulas is to understand where they come from. Right? Um, and <clears throat> uh, I am uh, heavily reliant on that fact of understanding where formulas come from. And in my life, I don't believe I've ever memorized this formula. Right? What I have uh, very solidly uh, got into my head is this picture. And I could, can do trig. And so I don't need to memorize the formula. I understand the picture. And I can rederive the formula as needed because trig's easy. Um, so that's uh, a really good way to memorize things. And I'll point out with that in mind that if you, in fact, understand where the formulas come from in this class, right? And we're, that's, again, uh, y'all heard me go on at length, this course about ideas and understanding and reasoning, et cetera. Um, if you understand the ideas of where things come from, it will dramatically reduce your memorization workload because you don't need to memorize stuff that you can just see. Does that make sense? So I strongly encourage you in that direction. Okay, here's another really important idea related to this. If you look at this formula for component, um, check it out. This right here is our unit vector. So uh, you can rewrite then this formula as that. These are the same formula morally. I'm just sort of, uh, you know, reconceiving of the vector defining the direction in terms of, well, let's just think in terms of the unit vector. And uh, I find this even better. And uh, if nothing else, this formula down here has this advantage that it rolls off the tongue really nicely. Components are dot products with unit vectors. 
I just I think that's just very pithy, right? Very convenient to remember components or dot products with unit vectors. Super easy to recall. Okay. All right. Okay, now there's a related idea called projections. Um, a lot of people conflate projections and components. Uh, it's important that you don't conflate them as being the same thing. The big difference, now you're going to notice right off the bat that you know we have a, a V and then we have a W and then we make this triangle and we're interested kind of in this right here. And that's really what's going on in this picture as well. You know, we've got a V, we've got a W that makes this triangle and we're interested in this thing right here. It looks at a quick glance to be the exact same idea. There's a critical distinction, though. The critical distinction is that the component is a scalar. I hesitate to call this a distance because technically it can be negative, and technically the word distance means positive. And this is awkward, right? But coordinates and and uh, and distances are very closely related things, but they're not quite the same because coordinates definitely can be negative, distances <coughs> definitely can't. Right? Um, so anyway, uh, importantly, component is a scalar; it is not a vector. It's just a number. The projection is a vector. The projection is the vector itself that is that side of the triangle. Right. Now, it's easy to relate the projection to the component uh, by just kind of thinking through, all right, well, I, how do I describe this vector, this thing called the projection? Well, look, I know it, the direction that it points. The direction that it points is the direction that V pointed. We describe directions by unit vectors, so U is going to be our direction. Okay, fine. Now, what's the scalar factor, right? So by what factor do I want to multiply that unit vector? Well, that's literally the component from the previous page. Right? Um, and so uh, that gives us this uh, really nice uh, way of thinking about uh, projections. It's just component times unit vector. Up to it. And, of course... We have handy formulas for how to think about component. For example, component is dot product with a unit vector. So, boom. And, of course, U is something we've already written down. Um, so there you go. There's uh, the relationship between projections and components. Um, I, for whatever it's worth, I think this is the slightly more important formula to remember because, again, this is a formula that indicates a relationship between ideas. You all are going to get... Sick and tired of hearing me say that, but again, it's really central and uh, critical to what this course is about. Uh, we see here a relationship between two related but distinct ideas. Um, my second favorite way to think about projections is this formula, because uh, well, anyway, it's uh, it's a formula. It's computationally convenient. Um, but you really have to kind of root through to see what's going on. You have to kind of think to yourself, oh, yeah, and the reason I care about this is because it's a component. So um, there's that. Now, there's a third way to think about this that the book presents, and it, there's no deep water here. The book just makes the observation that U is something we have a formula for on the previous page. And plugging that in, you get this third formula for projection. And this third formula for projection does have something nice about it. Oh, gosh. Uh, let's see here. You know what? I need to uh, do that. There we go. Uh, this third formula, what's nice about this is it's very plug and chug. And, okay, there are situations where you need to plug and chug, but, yeah, notice in particular, whatever that V is, yeah, boom, there, 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 there. And whatever this W is, okay, yeah, it goes right there. So this is straight up plug and chug. Now, I know that that has a strong appeal, <laughs> right? Um, but, uh, again, I remind you, being able to crank out numbers is pretty low on our list of interests. Right, so the fact that this is computationally convenient, okay, I guess, whatever. 
not that relevant for what we're going to be doing, right? Much more important is to be able to see the connections to other ideas. I, that's the wrong color, of course. Uh, so this, again, uh, top choice, and this is a uh, close second. Everybody with me? All right. Okay, moving along. Uh, a real quick comment before we finish 1.3. Um, uh, vector algebra can actually allow you to do certain very convenient proofs in, in uh, plane geometry. This is regular old high school geometry, certain facts about how, oh gosh, you know that uh, parallelograms, if you take the midpoints of the edges, blah, blah. It's, it's some cool facts of, uh, you know, a sort of unexpected things. And uh, using vectors to describe the edges and vector algebra to describe how the, it always comes around back to the same point allows you to get an algebraic foot in the door and uh, very conveniently you can prove some neat facts uh, about geometry. So the book has a couple of examples in it, right? And uh, I think it's a pretty straight read. Uh, there's not that much, uh, uh, oh, let's see, how to, I don't want to overstate this, but there, there, I don't think there's any deep ideas that that really require sort of, uh, you know, class time focus. So this is one of the many things in this class that I'm going to leave for you all to read. If you have any questions, of course, as always, come to my office hours. Oh, and then per my email uh, recently, um, you're also welcome to go to the TA's office hours. Right? And um, uh, he's, we got lucky. We got a really good TA, so I hope you all will capitalize on, on, uh, on that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, um, yeah, good. Moving on to 1.4. 1 um, 1.4 is a weird section. There are a lot of ideas. It's heavily geometric. And they, these ideas that we're going to be talking about, they connect in many different ways. So uh, very often, you know, when you're doing math, very often, you know, you have an idea and an idea and an idea and an idea and an idea, and the connections are, you know, pretty much like this. And so it's uncontroversial how to present this topic. You start with that, and then you talk, talk about how to, you can conclude that, and then you go through and you show how to conclude that. You just go in order, and it makes perfect sense. What we're looking at here in section 1.4 is really, I would better represent it as uh, these are the ideas and the connections between them are sort of like uh, this, uh, I don't know, maybe something like that. So what order do you present these ideas? And different people have different ideas about what the most natural way to do it is. You know, I, for example, might want to do uh, that. That wouldn't be unreasonable. Covers all the ideas. Or misses some of the connections. I guess I, you know, I kind of missed that part right there. Um, another perfectly reasonable path through these ideas would be to start here and then go, you know, like, that totally different presentation. We were talking about all the same ideas, right? So this is a slight awkwardness of how this section uh, works. Um, the book has some perfectly reasonable choices along these lines. I like to do it differently. And so y'all are going to, it's a pro-con thing. I mean, what I'm going to do is not straight out of the book. Mm, so, you know, there's like the slight downside to that, but the upside is you get options. You can see various different ways to connect all these ideas. Um, I think mine is the most um, geometrically helpful, and I think that's what we need to focus on in a class like Math 219. Um, there are some results that I'm not going to prove. Um, I think that's a relatively low priority in this case. So anyway, that's why uh, you're going to notice a big difference between uh, my notes and uh, the book uh, in, this, uh, in this area. So okay, let's dive in. Um, let's start off with this idea of an ordered list. Uh, a list is exactly what you think. Uh, the word ordered here is technically not necessary. Lists implies order. But uh, just to emphasize 
right? I like to point out that this is a list where the first vector listed, oh, whoops, the first, come on, button, here we go. The first vector listed is to be thought of as first in the list, and the second one listed is to be thought of as being second. This is not a set, right? A set doesn't have an order. Sets just, there's a couple things in there, and uh, they just there. So very importantly, this is a list. Um, <clears throat> so uh, if I have a list, reasonable question to ask is, is there anything intrinsically geometric about that list? And I like to point out, uh, let's think, uh, for example, about, I uh, suppose, these are what my vectors are, the A and the B. Suppose it's, you know, these right here. If that's the actual vectors in this list, then A first, B second suggests counterclockwise. Okay. Um, on the other hand, if these are my two vectors, A first, B second, in that case would mean clockwise. So, uh, the, you know, depending on what the vectors are, a list, there is something intrinsically geometric about the order that I put the vectors describing the directions that I'm, that I'm interested in here. Um, so uh, I, we use the term uh, clockwise and counterclockwise uh, to describe the list, depending on whichever of these, you know, geometrically, uh, which, whichever one is the actual case. Okay. Uh, right. Now, uh, sometimes it's neither. Uh, so, uh, again, if you look at this story right here, um, they point in the same direction. There is no clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, another version of this, some, what if the A vector was the zero vector? Well, then again, there is no clockwise or counterclockwise. There's various different uh, weird anomalous uh, special cases that don't fall into either of the previous two categories. As it turns out, all of those cases are linearly dependent. Uh, again, big term, I'm sure you all recall from Math 218 or 221. Okay. All right, so uh, these are the three different categories. Um, now, it turns out this is not just an arbitrary set of rules that we can write down. This is geometrically very natural. Um, if you reflect a vector over a line. And if you do that to both of the vectors in your list, right? notice that what had been counterclockwise turns into clockwise. So the sort of uh, convenient way to describe this is that clockwise and counterclockwise as adjectives are reflections of each other, or they're mirror images of each other. So this is a pretty cool fact. Right? This, this, this makes, uh, makes it clear that there's something geometrically natural about this distinction. Alrighty. Um, and then uh, some other little easily observed facts. I'm going to let y'all think through the details here, but uh, I claim if you trade the positions on the list, in other words, the one that was first, if you put it second, and the one that was second, you put it first. If you switch the order in the list, that will change the geometric uh, descriptor. Counterclockwise becomes clockwise. Again, picture, think it through. Um, <clears throat> claim the order is independent of rotations. Uh, if you have, for example, AB counterclockwise, like so, Notice if you then rotate the vectors, right? So I'm going to I'm going to talk through about what this the rotation is. Uh, if I rotate the vector A like that and if I rotate the vector B like that, then the resulting vectors the rotation of A, the rotation of B still counterclockwise, right? So again, uh, the, this is uh, something you can think of uh, more sort of uh, streamlined. You can, you can say well, this is independent of rotations, 
when you rotate a, a list, the order is preserved. Okay. All right, so a lot of sort of natural geometric features. Now, why are we talking about clockwise and counterclockwise? Um, aside from the fact that we're going to use this in a, a little bit, uh, it also is a fantastic segue to a three-dimensional analog. And this is one that's a little weird. Uh, I will point out that we relied here on you know, uh, an existing idea. Digital clocks have kind of taken over, but people used to use analog watches and clocks, right? And so the idea of clockwise and counterclockwise is an old and deeply entrenched in the culture uh, concept. And so we just uh, we got lucky. There just happened to be this easy and familiar uh, way to describe our sort of two different versions of the order. Um, so what's the three-dimensional analog? of clockwise and counterclockwise. And by the way, clockwise and counterclockwise is a tough sell here because look at my finger here, right? So I'm rotating my finger around. Is that clockwise or counterclockwise? It looks counterclockwise to y'all. It looks clockwise to me, right? So uh, it's a tough, uh, tough choice. So here's uh, what works, I think, much better and this is uh, what I'm going to call right-handed and left-handed. So the idea is as follows. There's some tricky little... I'm going to have to do some hand-waving here, literally. Um, let's talk about right-handed first. I'm going to use the human right hand as to do this. There's a particular gesture that you make with the fingers of your right hand. It has to be your right hand. And the gesture is this. So, importantly, your index finger needs to be parallel to your palm. Your middle finger needs to bend in the direction that middle fingers want to bend. So, no, you know, uh, contorting your fingers around like this. That's no fair. Uh, bending toward the palm you might say. And then thumb, again, going the direction sort of that thumbs want to go, and technically I guess I could do this, but again, don't, don't get too, too clever. Right, with the, so thumbs going the direction they want to go. Okay, so the idea then, is, with that in mind, is if you point your index finger in the direction of the first vector, and if you point your middle finger in the direction of the second vector, now let me actually stand up and do this. Um, coming over where the image is. Index in the direction of the first vector there, that's the direction A is pointing. Now I need to bend my middle finger to point in the same direction as B. Uh, notice my finger doesn't really want to, but keep in mind, I can move my hand around, right? I can, I can point my index finger in A's direction like this, or like that, or like that, or like this, right? A lot of options. So twist around your index finger like so until your middle finger bending as it likes to, points in the uh, in the direction of B. Right? Is that cool? Between those two vectors, that defines a plane. Your thumb then points on a well-defined side of that plane. Right? And if your third vector is on the same side of the plane as your thumb, then we call that a right-handed list. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the, how we do that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, then there is the left-handed idea, which is you know, pretty much exactly what you think it is. Just use your left hand instead. So index finger in the direction of the first vector, uh, middle finger in the direction of the second vector, etc. And then just for visual um, you know, dramatic purposes, notice A, B, C. Right? C is on the same side as my thumb of my left hand. Now, um, some students might be inclined to say, well, yeah, but you, you could have done this with your right hand. And I say, no, you can't. Let's try it. Right? Index finger in the direction of the first vector A. 
not look at B. B is going back that way, so check it out. I'm going to have to twist my hand around my index finger so that B, my middle finger, can go in the direction of B. And then notice now my thumb pointing downward. It's pointing below the plane. C is pointing above that plane. I can't do that with my right hand. Is that cool? So as it turns out, also a fairly convenient thing that we all um, <clears throat> have experience with, uh, right hand and the left hand, right? So um, it's kind of the three-dimensional analog of clockwise, counterclockwise. Um, and again, there's various different uh, cases that are sort of neither, right? So uh, this little scenario here, I have three vectors all parallel to the same plane, and I... Well, that's neither right-handed nor left-handed. And uh, there's various other versions of this. Um, one of the vectors could be the zero vector. Two of the vectors could be parallel. More, more than one of the vectors could be the zero vector. Uh, various different uh, things that don't fit, all of which linearly dependent. So again, it works out really analogously. There's sort of two cases that are most of the time one or the other, and then all the remainders are linearly dependent. So highly analogous, um, and those analogies continue. Uh, Right-handed and left-handed are mirror images of each other. Easy to see, right? No problem. Um, let's see here. Uh, when you trade two vectors, right? I switch the order of the A and the B in the list. And that turns right-handed into left-handed. Now, again, this is uh, that's a nice exercise to think through for yourself. But look at those, look at that trio of vectors there, and persuade yourself that ABC is right-handed, BAC is left-handed. Just got to do the hand gestures and persuade yourself that that's how that works. Come to office hours if it doesn't make sense, of course. Uh, the order is independent of rotations. Uh, this is another easy pitch, I think. If this is how I argue that A, B, C are right-handed, or make a right-handed list, and if I were to rotate all those vectors, then this is how I argue that the rotate, rotated list is also right-handed. Right? So again, I think that's a, a, a pretty easy one to see. Um, there is a, uh, uh, an additional cool fact uh, that once we get into three dimensions, there's a little bit more room to move, a little bit uh, more opportunities for cool things to happen. And so let's talk about cycling. Uh, the idea of cycling is that the one that was third becomes second, the one that was second becomes first, and the one that was first kind of falls off, and then we'll uh, put it right back around over uh, and make it third. All right, so if you cycle the vectors in a list, that preserves the order. So right hand stays right hand. Um, and again, a nice little sort of exercise to think through on your own. Here's, roughly speaking, here's the hand wave that I think does that most naturally. It's this move right here. All right, you see what I'm doing with my right hand? All right. And if this is, let's see here, if this, oh gosh, if this is A, B, uh, if this is A, B, C, then this is B, A, B, C, A, right? So yes? Um, do the vectors have to be perpendicular to each other? No, they don't have to be perpendicular at all. Uh, so yeah, good question. Um, so um, I can point my index finger in any direction, of course, right? And all I need for the second vector in the list is that that be the direction that middle fingers want to bend, right? So this does not have to be a right angle. Any angle uh, does fine. And then likewise, remember that once you have those two angles, that defines a plane. And all I care about is whether the third vector is on you know, one side of the plane or the other side of the plane, and uh, you know, it, it, it per yeah, perpendicularity is not required. Yeah. Okay. Yep. This is also old if you're cycling in the other direction, like the other Yes. So it was C A B. Yep. Way. Yeah, totally. That's right. That's right. And by the way, a, a nice way to see that is that cycling backwards is the same thing as cycling forwards twice. Uh, so yeah, preserved twice also is preserved. Yeah. 
but yeah, very good, very good uh, question. Okay, so um, yeah, we talked about these properties. Uh, now that we have uh, that done, I'm going to switch gears. We're going to talk about a different um, idea from linear algebra. You may have seen before, you may not have. It depends on your instructor. I think this is a really important fact of linear algebra myself. Um, <clears throat> and it's a lot to say. Oh, by the way, I have, I have not been keeping track of time. Okay, we have 20 minutes. That's good. Mm. Um, yeah, it takes a bit to, to make uh, the statement of this theorem. So bear with me as I, I have to construct a bunch of stuff. And once I construct various objects, then there are certain results that we'll have about them. We start with a list. By the way, we're going to start off just in two dimensions. We'll, we'll talk about the three-dimensional version in a minute. So two dimensions only. Um, <clears throat> if you have a list of two vectors in two dimensions, you can use that to make a matrix. Like so, right? First vector, make that the first column. Second vector, make that the second column. So if you give me a list, I give you a matrix. Now, I haven't... I haven't done anything yet. I'm just making stuff, right? Uh, so yeah, given a uh, given a list, you can make a matrix. Whoops. Given a list, you can make a matrix. Uh, given a matrix, of course, you can make a linear transformation. We talked about this last time, uh, that uh, this construction right here for any matrix gives you a linear transformation. Reminder, um, that's an old linear algebra fact. Um, and now here's another cool fact. If you have a linear transformation on the plane, you can talk about what happens when you plug in the unit square. And what comes out when you apply a linear transformation to the unit square is a parallelogram. And that's another nice little exercise in linear algebra, something to think through. Um, you want to make sure you can persuade yourself that this image is a parallelogram. Um, <clears throat> related note, I can tell you what the edge vectors are there because uh, I know that this bottom edge vector of the unit square is E1. If I want to know where that bottom edge of the square goes to, I can just take that and plug it into there. And notice that means that uh, I will be computing matrix times E1. And what happens when you multiply a matrix times E1? You get the first column. And that first column, you'll notice, is A. So the image of E1 is literally exactly A. And likewise, the uh, image of E2 is B. And so this, uh, so this second column here, excuse me, the second edge vector goes to the second column, which is the second vector. So the image is B. All right, is everybody with me so far? I haven't really stated the theorem yet. I'm just kind of constructing things. Is that cool? All right. Okay. So, with all of this noted, clean up my mess. There we go. Okay, so I had a list from which I made a matrix, from which I made a linear transformation, from which I made a parallelogram. Here's the first half of the theorem now. The setup done. First half of the theorem is that the determinant of this matrix. Oh, uh, gosh. Um, that's not what I wanted. The determinant of that matrix is the area of that parallelogram. Bonkers. This really bugged me the first time I learned this. How could this possibly be true? Um, let's just think through the, the, the story here, right? You, you look at the, how do you compute determinant 
Well, determinant is, uh, okay, it's that times that minus that times that. Y'all remember a determinant from way back when. Um, and uh, four function, or three function arithmetic. There's not even any dividing. Right. Trivial arithmetic to compute the determinant. What about the area? How do I compute the area here? Oh my gosh, the way I compute the area, typically we would drop a perpendicular and uh, that height uh, what we would call the height of the parallelogram is going to have trig in it. We're going to need to know the trig sine and cosine of that angle. And then I would need to compute this distance as the base. But that distance involves a square root. So this is super weird. The right-hand side of this equation feels like it involves square roots and trig. And the left side of the equation feels like it's three-function arithmetic. How could something much more complicated always equal to something that's much simpler. So again, first time I saw this, I basically didn't believe it. And I thought, okay, well, it's somebody's, somebody's pulling my leg here or something. <laughs> uh, but this is true fact, neat, true fact. Very surprising. Okay, um, here's the second fact. Uh, and <clears throat> I'm gonna, the, the second fact involves um, various cases. So I'm going to start with a case that I have drawn. Uh, what I have drawn here um, is uh, this case down here. Um, the determinant of this matrix is positive, as it turns out. And notice this order, A to B, is counterclockwise. So that's the kind of the, the first version of, uh, of this uh, second half of the theorem. Positive determinant means a counterclockwise order of the vectors. And recall, of course, these are the vectors that are the edges of the parallelogram. They're also the vectors that were in our original list. So real neat fact, if you want to determine clockwise versus counterclockwise, determinant does it for you. Just compute the determinant, positive or negative, end of story. Nice and simple. Very convenient. Um, so now here's another way to think about this. Uh, and again, looking at this picture, uh, I claim that uh, this linear transformation, uh, because of the, the fact that the right-hand side there is counterclockwise, um, that linear transformation, I claim, doesn't involve any flipping upside down. Nothing got flipped. Nothing got reflected. And the way I know that is... Uh, if you look at the standard basis vectors, E1, E2, that is also counterclockwise. Right? So what this linear transformation has done is it's taken a counterclockwise list and it has produced as an output another counterclockwise list. And when you flip things upside down or when you reflect through a mirror, clockwise and counterclockwise switch. This didn't switch, so there's no reflection. There's no flip here. So uh, yeah, so that's a, a nice uh, way to think about this. Um, you can think about the result as being a statement about the edge vectors being counterclockwise, or you can think about this result as saying that the linear transformation represented by the matrix does not have a certain geometric aspect to it, namely a flipping or a reflecting. Okay. All right, really important fact. Now, again, that, this is the first version of this statement. I can only uh, draw one version at a time, so now let me draw the second version of this statement. The second version uh, is uh, that uh, this is the vector B and that this is the vector A. And that case, let me, there we go. That case corresponds to this second version down here. Uh, this determinant would be negative. That is the indication that notice we have a clockwise ordering 
of the vector of the list a b keep in mind a first b second as i've got them drawn there that is clockwise and this again is what i claim would be an inversion of the plane uh, and it's an inversion of the plane because it remains it is always the case e1 e2 is always counterclockwise e1 e2 just sit there they don't move, right? So that's uh, always counterclockwise. So what has this linear transformation done? This linear transformation T has turned a counterclockwise list into a clockwise list. And that means it must have involved a flip or a reflection. So again, you can think about this, you know, how do you interpret a negative determinant? You can think about that as a statement about the ordering of the vectors, or you can think about it as a statement about the geometric actions in that linear transformation. Both of these have their uses. Um, students tend to make the mistake of picking one or the other. That's a mistake. You, you, sometimes you really do need to understand something about the linear transformation, not something about the resulting vectors. So, okay. All right, so uh, yeah, so that's the um, the two primary version uh, uh, cases of the theorem. Now there is the third case down here. The third case is determined it could be zero, and that just means that these two vectors on the right are dependent, which is uh, which is a weird picture, right? That means that this whole picture doesn't make sense. But A would be like that, and then B would be like that, and then my parallelogram would be about like that, and there's no area. <laughs> <laughs> in there, and there's no order to talk about. The whole thing just doesn't make any sense. So again, annoying when you have uh, linearly dependent. Okay. All right, so that's the two-dimensional version of the theorem. Uh, guess what? The three-dimensional version of the theorem is almost exactly the same. And I'm going to go through this quickly because it's the same. It's just all the same ideas. If you give me a list in three dimensions, okay. three vectors in three dimensions. I can make a matrix by which I make a linear transformation in the usual way, by which I then produce from the unit cube a parallelopiped. It's kind of a three-dimensional analog of a parallelogram, isn't it? And we get these morally equivalent results the determinant of that matrix, absolute value, got to take the absolute value, uh, gives you the volume of that parallelopiped. So it's, you know, volume instead of area, but size, right? Two-dimensional size in the previous case, three-dimensional size in this case. Very analogous. Um, and then again, you get some cool facts about, the, um, about the, how to interpret the sign of the determinant. Uh, positive means right-hand order, negative means left-hand order, zero means neither, aka dependent. And again, you can interpret those as statements about what the linear transformation is doing. Positive means right-hand order went to right-hand order, which means there's no reflection. Yeah? So the commas are basically like taking only ifs, right? Say, say one more time, please. Yes. Yeah. 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 But, yes. That's right. That. That's right. There. There are uh, diff three different ways of thinking about, in fact, the same results. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So positive determinant means that there is no reflection hidden inside of your linear transformation. Negative determinant means there is unavoidably a reflection hidden, possibly inside of your linear transformation. Uh, and again. Zero means dependent and everything's weird. And, you know, none of this makes sense. Okay, so really cool facts. I, I'm a huge fan of these theorems. I think they're uh, extremely useful. Now, I am not going to prove these theorems um, for two reasons. Uh, first of all, I don't really think that's what this course is about. Uh, getting all rigorous with the uh, the details of proofs uh, that are. Uh, I'm going to call kind of hard. Um, but the second reason is I know a fantastic proof of this result, these two results, 
I, if I'm going to prove this result, I want to do it the best way. And the best way eh, involves some sophisticated ideas that are a little beyond what is appropriate for this class. And so rather than wade through a bunch of inconvenient trig and algebra and, oh, God, it's just so inconvenient, uh, that's not a good way to prove a theorem anyway. So I just think it doesn't make sense in this class to, to focus on the proof. So I'm not going to do it. So y'all can take this these two results as given. These are just... Uh, you know, statements that we'll, we'll assume. Okay, let's see. How are we doing on time? Okay, I have four minutes. Uh, cool. So, okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, again, a little bit different from what the book does. Uh, y'all can read the book if you like. By the way, I encourage y'all to read through the book's presentation on this. And then, and then decide for yourself. You don't have to tell me. But decide for yourself, which one do you like better? And I think what you're going to find is that the book's way is a lot clunkier, a lot more tedious, a lot less geometric, and yes, more rigorous. I don't think that we care about that. But anyway, so uh, compare and contrast for, your, for yourself. Okay, so uh, here is the formula for the cross product uh, right here. Uh, this is the definition of a cross product of two vectors. Uh, very importantly, both of these vectors have to be in R3. Uh, the cross product as I'm defining it here only makes sense in three dimensions, not two, not four, not five. Three only. As a preview, um, I'll note that there's a homework exercise where they define what they call a generalized cross product, which is a very cool idea, and it does allow you to do some neat things, and there's a homework exercise where they want you to kind of think through some of those analogous ideas. Um, uh, so uh, the generalized cross product is a thing, but cross product in general, three dimensions. Okay. Uh, okay, now why... Again, one of our big questions that we care about, why would anyone ever go to the trouble to write down that weirdo formula, right? Seems pretty, pretty arbitrary and random, and what's with all the minus signs, and uh, what's going on there? So um, I am going to, it's going to take me a little bit of time to develop exactly what it is about these, uh, this formula that is so extremely useful. Uh, but we'll, uh, that'll be the subject of sort of the rest of this section. So uh, first observation I want to make is that this is what I like to call a symbolic determinant. Um, so uh, by symbolic, what I mean is that what I have written down here is a little bit bogus, a little bit nonsense, as follows. What do you do with determinant? Well, in a determinant, you put in a matrix. Fine. So is this a matrix? Well, a matrix is supposed to have elements that are numbers. Many of these elements are numbers, but not those, <laughs> right? So can you do that? Can you make a matrix where the elements are vectors? It's pretty fishy. So now that said, uh, if you just kind of ignore that fact, and if you just kind of play like that's a matrix <laughs> and compute the determinant as if that was a thing, right? Then what you will find is that this uh, symbolic, oh gosh, did I run out of pen at just the right moment? Um, this symbolic determinant gives you exactly that formula, namely exactly the cross product. So for your consideration, and this will be a good ending point, um, uh, again, in my life, I have never memorized that formula. And I don't recommend that you memorize it either because it's so much easier to remember this formula. Just remember this symbolic determinant formula. And uh, very importantly, uh, on the top row, you always put the standard basis vectors. That's just the, the, the rule. Uh, the first vector in your cross product makes the next row and the second vector in your cross product makes the last row. 
So that formula is pretty easy to remember to memorize. Uh, Y'all have already done the uh, difficult task of memorizing some weird plus and minus rules involving determinant, and that perfectly keeps track of the you know sort of weird uh, pluses and minuses, uh, various minus signs that are involved there. So uh, this uh, uh, avoids duplicating effort. And uh, now that you know, because you know determinant, this uh, formula on the right much easier to remember. Okay, we'll draw the line right there. I'm bound to be out of time by now. Yep. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, picking up here on uh, tomorrow, Friday. See you all later. Have a good one.